What is up? Back again with the Two Tall Sports Podcast. Thank you for joining me. As always, we drop episodes every Thursday, so please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you can. Drop a comment, DM me. You can find me at Two Tall Sports Podcast. Please check me out on YouTube. You can subscribe there and uh, listen to our YouTube channel and watch the interviews there as well. Hit the bell notification. Like I said, we drop episodes every Thursday. So check out the Two Tall Sports Podcast. If you're on Apple, please subscribe and also go all the way down to the bottom. Find those five stars. Hit me up with a five star if you could. That would help the show out a lot. And if you want to uh, leave a comment or review uh, on the bottom, please do so as well. It also helps the show. We're on Spotify. We're on Amazon. We're on Pandora. We're everywhere. So all platforms and just type in two tall sports podcast my guest today is zach penpraise he's a professional baseball player uh he played for a long time in fargo north dakota and he's a local legend there so we uh, get into all that stuff he's also going to participate in the 2021 olympics so baseball is an olympic event now zach is on that team part of team israel which i qualify or helped in the qualifier we didn't qualify but the guys did in the last couple years and uh they're going to be in the olympics so israel's going to have a baseball team in the olympics so really cool and uh, Zach dives into all that today. He's also a mental skills coach now, and we really dive into, you know, what what the leaving baseball does and what happens to your identity. And he's got great messages to for young athletes now as well. So um, lots of good mental skills from Zach today. So please enjoy the episode with Zach Penfraze, and I'll see you on the other side. All right, welcome back to the Two Tall Sports Podcast. My next guest is a professional baseball player. He will be part of Team Israel's bid to play in the 2021 Olympic Baseball Tournament this summer. He is a big advocate for mental performance and coaching young athletes, and he's playing independent ball this year for the New York Boulders in the Frontier League. He's also a SoCal native, and he played his college ball at Mississippi Valley State. He's Zach Penpraise. What's going on, Zach? Thanks for being on the show, man. How's it going, man? Thanks for having me. Yeah, definitely. Glad to have you on. Lots of lots of good stuff to talk about. And um, you got a lot of exciting things happening this summer, especially playing baseball again, and you're going to play in the Olympics. So before we get to your background, how would you describe the opportunity, you know, looking forward to play in the Olympics this summer? It's something that just came as a surprise. You know, girl, everybody kind of says, uh, you know, it must be a dream come true. And, and honestly, I, I never dreamed of playing in the Olympics. So it, it just, it's just an opportunity that presented itself. And at first, I didn't really want to play. I was, you know, early on in being a dad, my daughter was about three months old. I was starting my career. I was building my, my men's performance business. I was also just trying to make money. And so I was just kind of everywhere. I was coaching, building a business, working to make money. I just became a dad. And, and my wife just kind of said, what are you doing? Like, this is for the Olympics. Like, you have to do it. And I call her my mental performance coach. So, <laughs> you know, anything she says goes. And so it's really just kind of a surprise. And now it's just like we're in awe. Every time we meet up, every time we see each other, every time we just get on a Zoom call as a team, it's just like amazement. No, I totally get that, man. It's different when you're playing for yourself in the minor leagues, which is a very selfish lifestyle. And now you're playing for your country, which is completely different. So I'm sure you felt that too the first time you started even getting around the guys to practice. Yeah, definitely. And I've never experienced instant chemistry the way that Team Israel has it. You know, we're playing for something deeper and bigger. And it's just something that in Bulgaria, when we first met up, it was just like instantaneous chemistry. It's like we knew each other for life. And I've never experienced, I played on championship teams and I've never experienced something like this. Yeah, no, for sure. And we'll get back into Team Israel in a little bit because, um, you know, I also played in the qualifiers then. So I want to kind of compare that. But um, let's go talk about your background for a little bit. So you're from Moore Park, California, just outside of L.A. So what kind of baseball player were you in high school and were you, you know, heavily recruited? You know, when did you really start to hit your stride as like, all right, I got a chance to play college ball now? Yeah, definitely. I was always a, I was always a good athlete. I played Many sports growing up. I, I got my black belt in hop keto when I was eight years old. Oh, wow. I did gymnastics. I did tap dance, jazz. I, I was a dancer. Uh, I played basketball, soccer, everything. I wanted to quit baseball to play golf. You know, I love tennis. So I was always a good athlete. And it did translate to playing baseball, obviously. 
And I think as a young kid, I was kind of a guy that was just scrappy. You know, one of my kid, one of my teammates in Fargo, he calls me squirrely. So he's like, okay. he's, you know, he's a squirrely player. He gets on base. I'm a tough out. And I've always been a tough out. I've always made, I've always made a lot of contact driving the ball, like just everywhere, getting on base, being a you know good base runner. And then in high school, um, it was kind of the same thing, but I was kind of behind everybody in the sense that there were shortstops and infielders that played, you know, above me that played, you know, on varsity when I was on freshman or on varsity when I was JV. And I really didn't play. I didn't really start every game in high school till I was a senior. And, you know, that's unheard of nowadays that, you know, kids, they have to play varsity when they're a freshman. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it was really a thing where even when I was a junior on varsity, I was splitting time. And then um, when I was a senior, I started playing every day and, you know, one of my games now is stealing bases and I, I didn't really steal bases. I hit for a good average. I scored a lot of runs. I was terrible at defense, like absolutely terrible at defense. It wasn't a surprise when I made three errors in a game, you know, I, my throwing, my accuracy with my throwing was, was terrible. And so I understood that from then on, I had to work on my own to develop everything. Like literally I knew I was going to hit, but I had to develop the rest of my game. And so I really worked hard on my defense. I really worked hard on my accuracy with my throwing. And so I, I learned everything because I had to out of necessity or else I wasn't going to make it. And so in high school, I wasn't much of a stolen base guy. wasn't much of a defender in college. I started to get much better at both. I, I knew I was going to hit. So I, I worked on that, but I really put emphasis on fielding the baseball and um, stealing a lot of bags. You know, my last year when I got drafted, I stole 57 bases. In all of my high school career, I might have stolen 10. My first year in college, I stole four. And then I went to 44. And then I went to 57. So I was really working on that. And then I wasn't making many errors. You know, I had someone tell me, dude, we know you're going to hit. You got to work on your defense. And my, one of my summer ball coaches said, dude, if you don't field 987 or above, you're not going to get drafted. And so I took those and I took those to heart and I worked on them. So I totally changed my game from high school to college. No doubt. I was a completely different player now than I was in high school. Yeah. And usually like, you know, shortstop's an important position on defense. So are you sit like they, at least they didn't stick you in the outfield, right? I'm sure you, with your speed, <laughs> you could have done well there, but you know, usually if you're making a ton of errors in the infield, it's good that they stuck with you. So you could work through it a little bit. Yeah, definitely. And, and I, I always had good range. So I'd get to a lot of balls and that was kind of that even, even now in professional baseball, I, I would make 20 errors because I got to a lot of balls, you know, but I think the thing then was like the balls right at me. I still couldn't even field. So I'd okay. get to a lot of balls. I'd make a lot of sick plays, but then it was the ball at me that I didn't understand that I had to move my feet in order to field them. And now right. I'm like all, of, all about footwork. So. Hey, that's what it's all about, man. You, you worked on your craft and you got better. So that's good. That's, that's what it's all about. So I'm glad how they did didn't you... move into outfields, <laughs> but <laughs> I know, right? now, actually now, you know, with team Israel, I'll probably be playing outfield. Okay. Olympics, so we'll see. Well, I mean, at least, I mean, I saw you were starting every game for them. So that's whatever, you know, in that regard, like we were talking about, when you get to that kind of setting, wherever you play, it doesn't matter. You just want to be a part of the whole thing. So I get that. Definitely. How did you, I just, I mean, of course, I'm curious. The only person I know that went to Mississippi Valley State was Jerry Rice, of course, one of the best, arguably probably the best receiver of all time in the NFL. So how does a kid from SoCal end up playing at Mississippi Valley State? Amazing story. And it's always great to hear people say like, oh, you went to Jerry Rice's school. It's like, it's almost like my name is being mentioned with Jerry Rice. Yeah, so. And you're one of the greats. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it was, it was one of those things where, you know, honestly, in high school, I had some coaches that I, I I've been kind of a guy that rubbed coaches the wrong way my whole life. And in high school, I had, we had an assistant coach and then also even the head coach that, you know, I don't really know these for a fact, but they didn't really help me get to the next level. I was sending out letters and I was trying to e even walk on anywhere, but I wasn't highly recruited. You know, like I said, I'm a completely different player now than I was in high school. Yeah. And my, my high school coaches kept telling college coaches that I needed more playing. I, I needed to go to Juco and all this stuff. And I feel like they're, they didn't help me at all. And um, I just, I put a video online and back then you actually paid people to do that. Now you yeah. can just put it in, you can just put it up for free. I paid somebody to put it online. My, the college coach I played for Doug Shanks uh, in Mississippi Valley state. He saw a video, gave me a call and said, I want you to come here. And I was like, I don't even know where that is. So he flew me out. I did a visit. I had the best weekend of my life. And before the weekend was over, I was like, I'm coming here. 
And I could basically committed like while I was still there, I, I had no other options and it was D one. And I looked at the schedule. We played Mississippi state, Alabama, like we were playing sec teams, you know, like I basically was kind of in the sec and I, I just jumped on the opportunity. I didn't want to go to Juco. I didn't really want to walk on anywhere. And it was like, I literally committed like July after my senior year. I had nowhere to go until like July after my senior year. And a month later I was, you know, I was making a trip out to Mississippi. And so that's, that's kind of the story is like, I wasn't highly recruited. I wanted to go to Oregon state or Michigan, or I wanted to go to these big time schools, but nobody knew who I was. And so this guy took a chance on me and was like, I need a shortstop and it looks like you can hit the ball. So like, bring it. No, that's awesome, man. And I, I just had some guys on my podcast recently, and they're all about getting video for recruiting purposes to get kids more exposure for colleges. And like when you and I were growing up, we didn't really have like we had, I had to send video also just to get exposure. If you're kind of a late bloomer, you're not going to get the looks. And I think you said something that was interesting that high school coaches don't always push you to colleges or help you get recruited. They're not in that business. So I understand what you're saying. Plus, if you were kind of, you know, not on the best terms with them, they're definitely not going to help you get recruited. So no, definitely that. not. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to talk, I mean, you had a, a great career at Mississippi Valley state. I mean, I, I, I saw online, it said 60 bases one year that you stole. I think you said 57, but it was quote, whatever, 50 plus stolen bases, which might've led the nation. So what do you remember about that season where you just became a stolen base warrior and you're like unstoppable when you get to first. So first of all, it was 60. Okay. I, I, I had it in my head. I was like, I'm stealing 60 bases. I'm going to lead the nation with 60 stolen bases but they only gave me credit for 57. I kept I track see. of all of them. You know, okay. I didn't, I didn't count any defensive indifferences, nothing like okay. I, it was 60, but they gave me 57, whatever. It still sold. It still led the nation. And it was one of those things where I, I tell coaches all the time. My first year I was still kind of hesitant because I wasn't sure how the coaches would respond when I got thrown out. And we worked on stealing bases with everybody. Like our team was super fast we had guys running six two sixties, And so we would just, everybody would work on stealing bases. And I started stealing bases and I'd get thrown out and I'd come back to the dugout, like thinking I might get yelled at. And they would always say, keep going, keep going. So they put in this, this no fear mindset for me because I was, there was no consequences. It was literally just keep going, keep going, keep going. So I developed this mindset. What I, I'm writing a book about it right now. It's called the, the mindset of a base stealer where it's similar to a hitter where you're always swinging. It's yes, 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 until no. And so I'm always stealing second or I'm always stealing third until I'm not, until something else stops me. You know, I'm always going until the pitcher slide steps. I'm always going until I don't get a good jump. It's not, it's not I'm going if I get a good jump. That's so hesitant. So I developed this thing where I'm, I'm always getting to the next base. I'm always scoring from first. I'm always scoring from second. I'm always going to the next base. So I had this aggressive mentality. Next thing you know, I steal 20 in a row. I get thrown out the 21st attempt and then I steal another 20 in a row. So it's like, it's that I, they gave me the no fear. They had no consequences. And then, so I just developed this mindset where I just, I, and you know, I studied pitchers to a T. I understood that they all had different moves lefties are the easiest i don't know if you're a lefty pitcher but no, i'm righty man. so yeah that you can read the lefties yeah lefties think they're so smart they look at you and <laughs> throw home and then they look home and pick over they yeah. think they're so sneaky and so yeah. i i started understanding all this and then i worked on my jump itself i learned how to run into in a straight line to second most efficient running pattern and i wasn't the fastest guy i mean i was a, i ran a six nine which is fast, but not, it's not blazing, you know? So yeah, you just got great I, jumps and you read people. Well, I would get the best jumps. I understood what counts to run in. I, I just, I, I got so detailed with that stuff and, and, but I give all my credit to my college coaches because they just pushed everybody to just, Hey, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. There was no consequences until you got thrown out maybe five times in a row. Sure. But one, one, it was just like, all right, cool. You still have the green light. Just keep going, keep going. You know, in high school, I never had the green light. And so it was always, it was always hesitant. And then, you know, in college, it was like, just go. And next thing you know, I'm just getting after it. Still five, five bases in a game. And it just was easy. 
Wow. And you're hundred percent right about the coaches. If they establish that mindset of just be free and play, then you're probably going to have more success anyway. If you're that aggressive on the basis, especially in college, you know, it's very, it's all small ball and you put that much uh, like heat on the defense. That's a big deal. If you can be aggressive that way. Yeah. You put pressure on everybody. You're just a yeah. pest. Everybody just hates to play against you at right. that point. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you, how would you guys as a team did like what well, success wise, you know, what was your, you know, which year was your best year with that, with Mississippi Valley? My best year was the year I got drafted. Um, yeah. as far as a team. Yeah. I, I would say as far as a team, our best year was the year I got drafted. And, uh, my freshman year, we were actually really good too. I, I, you know, we, we did very well my freshman year, but I would say my junior year, 2006, yeah. You know, we played, I think, five or six top 25 teams. I mean, we we faced Scherzer and held our own. We faced – and he wasn't even their Friday night guy. Their, their Friday night guy we did pretty well off of. We almost beat Mississippi State that year. We lost 4-2 to two with a runner on second. I actually got the last out. It was runner on second base, 4-2 to two in the ninth. So, like, we had, we, we had opportunities. We played against Georgia Tech. They stomped us. Alabama, we, you know, Alabama, we, we'd be close in one game, and then we get stomped one game. But we held our own, and but my first two years we did uh, we did win the eastern uh, the eastern part of the conference, and so you know that those were our good years. But I think we had our best team, you know, the year I got drafted. So it's hard to say. It really is hard to say yeah. because my my freshman year, the older guys taught me so much, and they could play baseball like they were just ballers. They wanted to work hard and get better. And that was it. They wanted to stomp on people. So my freshman year was a great year. We had a great team. And uh, that was our best chance of winning it. But I think we played much better against the big time schools with the, the year of my junior year. Yeah. And I wanted to talk to you and, and mention that also you were all conference 2005, 2006. So you're definitely, you know, you had a great career um, and you eventually get drafted, like you mentioned by the Phillies in the 13th round in the 2006 draft. So what do you remember about getting drafted and the whole process, maybe leading up to it, you know, all the different phone calls and you know, where am I going to go? What do you remember about the draft? Uh, see, wow. A lot of emotions. Yeah. yeah. And uh, leading up to it, I remember scouts coming to my school and giving me like an, like an eye test and some kind of like writing test. And, and then, you know, different, uh, different scouts would come and ask me what's my signability and how much money I wanted. And I was like, I have no idea what any of this means. Yeah. I was like, I just want to play baseball and try to make it to the big leagues. I was like, maybe 50,000. I don't, I don't know. Like, yeah. I don't really know what a number is. I just want to play baseball and try to make it to the big leagues. That's what I kept telling them. But, you know, when it came to draft day, um, I remember that morning the Phillies called me in like the eighth round and they were like, Hey, uh, we're going to take you in the 10th. And like, I, like I didn't say anything. I was just like, I, I was speechless. I had nothing to say. My dream was about to come true. Right. And so I hesitated and I was like, okay, awesome. And, and I remember the guy saying, Oh, you sound hesitant. All right, we'll call you back. And he hung up. And I remember the 10th round passed and I started crying. I was like, dude, I was like, why, why did they think I was hesitant? I don't know. I'm, I'm just happy. Like, I don't know what to say. And I thought my dream was over. I thought I wasn't going to get drafted. And then, uh, my, my advisor at the time texted me and said, um, the diamondbacks are going to take you in the, in the 13th. And I was like, okay, my dream is still alive. And then, my, and then my name popped up in the 13th by the Phillies. And I was like, oh, that was weird. Awesome. Yes. And I, you know, it was just so much emotion going on. And actually, funny enough, the shortstop that started over me my junior year, he was a, he's a great guy, great shortstop. Uh, Blake Sharp, he, he got drafted that next round by the Diamondbacks. So I was actually going to get taken over somebody who started over me in high school, which is kind of cool to say, you know, and yeah, but you know, the Phillies took me instead and then the Diamondbacks took him because I was already gone. So like, right. you know, it's, it's pretty fun and a lot of emotions, just, you know, a lot of hugs, a lot of crying, a lot of happiness. And it just, it's such a whirlwind because we don't know what that is about until it's right. in our face. I don't know right. how much money to say, you know, I don't know any of that. Yeah. I just want to play baseball. Right. No, I, I totally get that. Same here, man. Same, same feelings that I had. So you start out in the New York Penn League in short season, which is, is one of the lower low A levels uh, in the minors. Um, and you were a midseason all-star. So everything seemingly started out really great for you. Um, 
I saw in another interview you referenced about the coaches maybe messing with your game a little bit and changing things, you know, post All-Star break. What, what did you mean by that? What happened after that first half of your first minor league season? Yeah, uh, it's, it's, wow. You know, I was hitting about 280. I was leading the team in hitting. I was leading the team in stolen bases. I was playing second base great. I might have had two errors in the first half of the season. Made the All-Star team. And they never really mentioned anything to me about changing anything. They just let me play the first half of the season. And then I made an error in the, um, in the all-star game. And it was a double play. I went to go turn and I flung it out of my glove. And uh, when I came back, the first thing they said to me was like, Hey, we need to change some things in your swing and, and defensively. And I just responded with like, can I just finish up the season? Like I, I feel great. And they're like, no, you toe tap. And you, you know, you're not gonna be able to toe tap at the higher levels. And I always remember referencing Derek Jeter. I was like, Derek Jeter does it. And their a lot response, of guys do. Yeah. yeah, you know, and their response was, oh, that's Derek Jeter. And I was like, oh, he was just Derek Jeter all the time, you know, like. And so that's when the, the kind of the tension between coaches and me started because I just wanted one year to be left alone. If, if it didn't work out, let's, let's work on some things like, like maybe off-season spring training. Why are we doing it midseason? And so from then on, I was deemed as this uncoachable guy. So – you know, I, I tried it. I, tr I tried what they were saying. I ended up finishing my, my season. I went from 280 to 219. I finished my season going one for 52. I was literally 0 for 51 um, and got a hit like my last at bat and got a hit and was like one for 52, my last 52 at bats. And I hated baseball. I, ha I hated it. Like I, I, I knew it was just the business I hated. I know I don't hate the game of baseball, but the business of it where I was doing fine. And then, you know, in spring, so then that off season, I started working with a, Met, uh, a Mets performance coach, went into spring training. I would go into double A, triple A games because they didn't have a spot for me. And I would rake, I would literally be, I would hit like, I think I hit every spring training, I hit like 400 in double A, triple A, and they still didn't have a spot for me, you know, and, and it was because strictly because I, I wasn't coachable. I didn't listen to them uh, because I didn't want to change the way I was doing things. So that's, you know, that, that's not just me. That happens to thousands of players. I know that for a fact. And it's just frustrating because, you know, it wasn't about development. It was about putting a stamp on me and telling me I couldn't do something unless I did it their way. And that's really frustrating to me. And I know not all coaches, not all, all organizations are like that. But, you know, I really had a bad taste in my mouth after that first season. I can tell you that it's 100% true. When I was with the Pirates, they were, they were just like that, where they wanted to, like for pitchers at least, they wanted everyone to throw the same way. They wanted everyone to have similar mechanics. And it, it was – you're messing with guys success already. They've already proven you drafted them because they were good already. You know, you don't, the whole molding thing, it ruins a lot of guys careers that you don't really hear about that. And you know, one thing I say is when I got picked up by the Red Sox in 2009 out of independent baseball, I, the coach, I was in the cage one time with the coach and I wasn't really responding and he was just talking to me and I, I was just kind of saying, okay, but he knew I wasn't really listening. He goes, you know, you think you know everything. And I said, no, I don't think I know everything. You, you guys just don't give us credit for what we actually do know. You know, you think we know nothing and, and that's just wrong, you know, and I don't think I know everything, but give me some credit for what I do know and, and the talents and abilities that I do have. And then we can work from there. You know, it's not just like, you know, oh, this is a different level. You know, you guys are all your best player in your college team, but you know, it's different here. Well, can we work with what we got? Or are we just going to freaking make everybody do the same? It's just really frustrating. I think that's a great point because, and plus like for us, like we, we both played in college. Like we've had a lot of baseball. If you're a high school kid, fine. I get it. You haven't had real coaching yet, but if you have had success in college and for you all conference player, like you have a clue, you know, like I think you have an idea, especially what you do well and how your body and the muscle memory and everything just feels right. So for coaches to mess with people like that, it's, it's unfortunate. And that's why I don't mess with, with players that I coach, you know, like I, I, I give them options and I say, look, if you're going to throw this way, let's, let's, let's improve it. And that's fine. I'm not going to change the way that you do anything. Let's just improve it. Let's just work on it, build on it, you know? So I'm glad it happened to me. So I don't ruin kids the way that they ruin me. Right. Exactly. Um, so you had a brief stint in low A with the Red Sox after you left the Phillies. And then you had this incredible run with an independent ball with the Fargo Moorhead Red, uh, <laughs> Red Hawks, sorry, uh, where you became basically a local legend from what I saw with all the numbers and the records you put up and everything. So what was the difference for you between affiliated ball and the minors and then have that, again, freeing feeling, I'm guessing, of independent ball? 
Yeah, I am a local legend there. They're actually having uh, Zach Denbury's bobblehead night on August 21st. I got to give myself a plug there. So are um, they really? Yeah, they had Jersey oh, night a wow. couple years ago. And then now they're having bobblehead night. It's me sliding into second base. It's really, really cool. So that is yeah, cool. they treat they treat me like royalty there. And I love it there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the difference between minor league baseball and independent baseball is, is it's independent baseball is about winning. If you're winning, then nothing you you can do whatever you want dude you know you can play however you want you can it doesn't matter you're winning baseball and you're performing that's what it is yeah. if you're winning the minor leagues they don't care you have to be developing somehow and to me i, I i'm just a winner i want to win everything you know i'm competitive and i think if you're winning then everybody's doing something right and if you're winning guys are going to get picked up right if you have a college team that's they win the college world series a lot of those guys are going to get picked up and drafted yeah if you have a winning independent baseball team a lot of those guys are going to get picked up you know but if you have a winning minor league low a team three three of those guys move up you know and so that's really kind of where they have it backwards and i love the fact that like i could do whatever i wanted my coach in fargo was this, the same way he's like just you know just play baseball i like watching you play just steal bases and be that you know just be yourself and that's what it was. It had, there was no issues there. Um, we, we bumped heads at the beginning a little bit just because uh, he didn't like when I argued. I wouldn't like argued with umpires, but I wasn't really arguing. I just kind of like said something and then he said something to me and I was just filling in at first. Right. So like I was just filling in. So he's like, this guy's temporary anyways. Next thing you know, he couldn't he couldn't release me because I was just falling out so hard. So. <laughs> But anyways, the bottom line is now we're good friends. I talked, I just talked to him last week and he just liked to watch me play baseball. He brought me in every year. I didn't care about the money part. I just wanted to play shortstop and just be able to just be a free man and play baseball. So that's the difference. I mean, a lot of freedom and, and I was a winner, man. Like I did everything I could to, to win baseball games. No, that's awesome. And it's, it's great. And I played independent ball for one year also. So I totally know what you're talking about, where they're not on you about whatever you need to do to get ready for the game. You do that or, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's all about winning. And it's a great, better fan experience too. You know, you got to sign autographs more often, whatever, but um, yeah, but that's I'm cool. all about fans. Dude. Exactly, fans make the yeah. game go around. Exactly. Uh, before we get to team Israel, I, I wanted to briefly talk to you about, you know, you becoming a huge advocate of the mental game and helping young athletes, you know, get through the game of failure, which is baseball, basically. And um, when did you start mentoring and coaching young kids and, and even young athletes or even college guys now? Um, and when did you start working with those those kind of players? Yeah, definitely. It was a it was a full journey for me that started when I. When I retired, because my last two years in Fargo, I became depressed. Um, I. I knew years before that I didn't want to get picked up and I was done trying to grind it out to the big leagues. So I was finishing on my career, but toward the end, my brain played tricks on me and I didn't reach the goal of making it to the big leagues. I became depressed. My last year, I was really bad. Like I was depressed for the first month. Luckily my roommate would get me out of bed and take me to the gym and get me moving and stuff like that. And so I went through a depression. And then when I retired, I started working for my dad and I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. So I started coaching. My, my brother was a big high school coach in, uh, in Southern California. And so I just started coaching with him and I became this angry, bitter ex professional baseball player, coach guy. And I found that every time I was talking to kids, it was strictly mental. They'd be like, yeah, coach, this is great in the cage. But when I get in the game, boom, like I, I just, I lose it. And so, you know, I, I, I called my mental performance coach and I said, I want to do what you do. And he, he, he was doing a program at the time. I went through it. But during that time, I was going through a massive spiritual healing. I had to forgive a lot of my past coaches. I had to forgive myself. You know, I went through a lot of memories. I discovered a lot of things from childhood that, was, that actually affected me with my coaches in professional baseball. And so I started to understand that a lot of guys are like this. They take these off-field experiences and and they take it into the game with them and it really it really affects how they play how they perform and how they deal with coaches and i wish i would have gone through a healing earlier and um so i started developing these programs to help more people like me and also younger kids that might be in the same situation as me so i started doing that in 2017 and I was just getting myself out there. I was going to businesses. Uh, I went to Lou, a local Lou Lemon store and I ended up becoming an, an ambassador of Lou Lemon. Um, you know, and so 
I just was getting myself out there. And through Lululemon, I created this men's excellence program, which it was just a program for me that helped me in my depression and tools that I shared with everybody. And so that journey started in 2017 and I just continued it. You know, when I do give lessons, I focus heavily on the mental game. Like you might spend an hour hitting with me. We may only hit for 20 minutes of that because we're talking about the approach, what you're thinking about, how you're, what, what intentions you have, you know, understanding the difference between an intention and a goal, what you're focusing on. And then I also ask like, when you're hitting, are you thinking about your girlfriend? Are you thinking about your assignments? Are you pissed off at your dad? And you're taking that into your game? Like, what is it? So we start to dive deeper into that because I'm a big believer. The mental health part for me is huge because I, I went through depression and I thought it was the only thing I knew how to do was play baseball. And it's not true at all. And a lot of guys, uh, I heard about a lot of guys committing suicide or overdosing or getting addicted to drugs. And it's just sad. And so that's where I'm big on the mental health. And I just like to share my tools that I've discovered through my spiritual healing, my spiritual healers and all my coaches. And I just, I just love that part of the game because I was never pretty. I never had a blowout thing. The only reason I had a blowout thing was I stole bases because I got the mindset right. So yeah, I understand that you get that mind, right. You connect my company's called connected performance. So if you can connect it all, then, you know, it's, let's roll with it. It doesn't matter how ugly you look. I love Hunter Pence because he looks terrible, yeah. but he just, he just balls out. And I got right. compared to Hunter Pence a lot. So my journey started in 2017 and I know it's going to be the rest of my life. So no, oh, that's awesome that you were able to find that and help guys because you've, you've seen a lot in baseball. And I was curious to kind of just follow up on that. Was it, the, do you think the depression was from the fact that you're losing your identity of a baseball player or that you didn't make it to the big leagues? It was like a, a mixture of like resentment, regret, and just an understanding that like I probably could have handled things a little bit better or differently. And then also I knew that I, that I had big league talent. I had got told many times by guys that played in double A, triple A, even the big leagues, that I was the best shortstop they ever played with. And so that slowly took a toll on my brain. Yeah. And so it might have been a mixture of my losing my identity. Um, but then also at the same time, like I didn't reach that goal that I had been visualizing for my whole life. I, I gave up everything. I, I never had a plan B. I didn't prepare for after baseball. Yeah. It was dude, baseball, 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 baseball. And, and when that's just gone, it's, it's not even a loss of identity. It's like, what do I do now? Is, is, is that the highlight of my life is now that I'm 30, is, is there nothing left that's going to make me excited about life? And so you start to question that and you don't want to, you know, you're working for your dad doing construction, which you never, I never wanted to do. Right. And I'm like, geez, what do I do now? And, uh, and then also you feel like a complete failure, even though I teach now that failure is awesome. And it's, you know, I have faith in failure, but you feel like a total failure. And yeah, it just takes a toll. It to I 100% agree with you, man. I, I tell people this often. I've said it on other other shows is like we spent years not building a real life resume. We just were playing baseball. So we're starting our lives at 30 years old, you know, so it's just it's it's hard. It's hard to, to start. You know, these kids out of college are getting jobs like entry level jobs. You know, now by the time they're 30, they're in their career for us. It's, yeah. You know, and if you build a if think if you built a business or a career for 30 years like an actual real life career or real life business and then 30 years it just it just blows up and it just yeah. it's gone you know a lot of people would be depressed if that happened you know so it's the same thing yeah no i totally agree um on a lighter note you were able to, co to <laughs> compete in the africa europe olympic qualifier in uh I'm sorry. Let's go back. I'm going to go to the 20. Uh, I was in, I did the qualifier for, for team Israel in 2012 in Florida. We didn't make it, but then you got to play in the 2019 Euro baseball championship, which, and also got your uh, dual citizenship in Israel. I wanted to ask you about that whole journey. How was that experience for you? Amazing. Uh, when I started going through my healing process, I started diving deep into my family history. And so it was just all perfect timing. Um, I, my, my grandmother died and then I started diving into her history. My family's from the Island of Rhodes, which is just off of Israel. My great grandfather's name is Reuben Israel. And so 
you know, diving into my roots, I always connected with the Jewish spiritual traditional part of my life. My dad's Christian, my mom's Jewish. And I always connected a little bit more with the spiritual part of, of Judaism. And so, you know, that whole, that whole journey was so cool. And it just felt connected instantly that when I, once I decided like, okay, my wife told me I have to do it. It was like, I was all in. I started discovering more and more about my family. You know, my, we took our honeymoon to the Island of Rhodes so I could actually get closer to my roots. So my oh, wife, wow. amazing that she did that for me. And it was also a beautiful place. So that whole experience is really cool. I had no idea what Israel would be like. You know, when I went there, I love it. I currently now say I want to live in Jerusalem, like in the old city and just open up like a Turkish coffee spot <laughs> and just live that life, dude. And, and so I'm super connected to it now. I'm not necessarily tradition, like religious in sure. a sense, but the spiritual and the traditions of Judaism and it's, it's a really, I'm really connected to all that stuff. So that's really cool. And it's just, it's so fun to, to be a part of this whole yeah, experience. Definitely. And now we'll get to the, the Italy 2019, where you guys played in the Olympic qualifier, um, which you won to qualify for the Olympics. So I can't imagine the emotions, but if you can describe what that whole thing was like. I, I cried on the field, you know, my, my one-year-old daughter came out to Italy a day after her first birthday. My mom was there. My dad was there. My wife was there. And my one-year-old daughter was there. Now I'm going to cry right now. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, um, it's just so cool. And you know, one of my friends told me, he said, you know, I know you didn't make it. At, you wanted to play in Dodger Stadium as a Dodger. But he's like, maybe this is what you were seeing your whole life as far as playing for the blue and white. Like, maybe this – and, and, you know, like that gave me chills right That's now. That's interesting. Just yeah. Thinking about the fact that I visualize myself playing in Dodger Stadium, wearing a blue and white uniform, but really I'm going to be playing for Team Israel on a much bigger stage uh, wearing the blue and white. So, you, man, when we qualified, it was a lot of built up emotion because we knew we had a chance to come top five in, in the European championship. And we, we knew we had a chance there. When we got to Italy, we kind of got excited because we were playing the teams that we lost to in the European Championship. And we knew in those kind of tournaments, it's tough to, to, to win, to beat a team twice. And so we were like, we kind of have the advantage. And when we went 3-0, and we were like, we started talking about what we're going to do in the Olympics. And all of a sudden, we got distracted. And that's why we lost our fourth game to, to the Czech. And if we would have lost to South Africa, the Czech would have been, they would have been in. Oh, um, wow. So, so when we beat spain and then curacao and then italy and we were three and oh and we only had two we had just had to win one more of those games we got a little bit distracted but we all were so emotional just thinking like wow we had such a low chance of doing this and now we are we're doing it and and i cried i mean i really did and shlomo lippitz always said yeah. he, he was saying you know before the before like that fourth game he was like you know he was like dude we just got to stay focused because something always happens to israel and, and now obviously they keep pushing back the Olympics. So maybe this is what's going to happen. But I mean, he always said, he said something always happens. And, you know, this time something didn't happen. We, we got it done. That's awesome, man. No, that's, that's pretty cool. I saw the highlights of you guys running on the field. Like it is really cool that you guys got to do that. So, um, so cool. Yeah, no, I bet. And so you're going to play for the New York boulders this year to hopefully, you know, probably prepare for the Olympics. Uh, what about this opportunity that came up for you instead of going back to Fargo, where we mentioned earlier, you're the, you know, a legendary player there. What about playing in New York is the opportunity you were looking for to get ready for the Olympics. Definitely. When we qualified for the Olympics, I got on the phone and, and I knew I had to, what I call empty in my bucket. I had to put everything into preparing. I wasn't going to play adult league every Sunday and just stay in shape. And then just all of a sudden see Japanese big leaguers freaking throwing amazing. Right. Yeah. I wasn't going to be that. Like Danny Valencia always says that guys, this isn't Bulgaria. When we showed up in Bulgaria, I was playing adult league and I went out there and I raked, but it's not, it's not going to be Bulgarian tournament. This is the Olympics this is big time. And I knew I had to prepare and I knew I just called. I, so I was talking to Fargo for a while. And they were kind of iffy, kind of iffy. And then they finally promised me a spot. And then the Olympics got canceled. And they're like, okay, we're not going to take you. Olympics got canceled. There's no point taking you. 
And then this year came up and I just kept begging them, begging them, begging them. And finally they were like, no, we can't, we can't have you on the team because we don't really have a spot for you. And we lost the veteran spot in independent Bay. We want to get in that sure. independent baseball. They have certain statuses. And so I just started calling every single team and I called Winnipeg. I called St. Paul. I was calling teams I'd never even talked to before. I called every team in the Atlantic league. They were only taking big leaguers or triple A guys this year. I called everybody and I was actually talking to TJ Stan a little bit and I knew he was coaching in 12 Rivieres the year before. And I was like, dude, I just need to prepare. I need 30 games under my belt because that's when I started to get hot. And he was like, I don't know if I can make it work. And then this year came about and he built his team and I just gave it one more, one more shot. I was like, dude, TJ, can we get this done? And he was like, I think we can. And, you know, I played with TJ in 2009, 2010 in Fargo. And then his assistant coach is Cole Zimmerman. And so I, he was, I actually, he was like my host dad for a couple of years in Fargo. And so we were teammates for a long time and they were like, I think we can get this done. So come in and prepare. And, and TJ keeps saying like, you're going to make me look like a smart man. He's like, you're, you know, you're 36, you're still in shape and you're going to make me look like a smart man. It's only beneficial to us. It's, it's great. It's like a big Jewish community around the stadium. And so it's going to be a really fun summer. We have a really good team. And to me, it's just about getting reps and seeing pitches, getting my body in that shape. So then when we do fly out to, to Tokyo, I'm in like mid season form, which is when I'm on fire. And I know that I know that. And I know myself and it's tough to leave my family. I got two little girls and it's, it's, it's going to be a tough summer, but I know I have to do it. And if I didn't do it, I would regret something whether I play a game in the Olympics or not, I'm putting all my energy into it and I have to play like that or else I'd have regrets. And so it's going to be a fun summer up here in New York and the boulders. I'm really lucky that they're giving me a, an opportunity to, to, to give it a go. Yeah, man. That's awesome. No, anything that you can do to get ready at the Olympics, it's like you said, empty the bucket, man. It, this is it. Um, as far as before we hit, I get to one of your favorite stories about Fargo, what was it like to, I've, I've never been to Fargo before. So what was it like? I only know of the movie, but um, what was it like for you to play there, live there for us that don't know about being in Fargo? Fargo is a hidden gem. Anybody that's looking to play baseball should probably go and spend a summer in Fargo. They, there is nightlife. If you want it, there's, there's a, there's country. If you want it, you just want to live in the country and just keep to yourself. You can during the summer. It is spectacular. They love sports. They love their football team. They love their colleges. They love, they love their Red Hawks. They love going to the lakes in the summer. They just, they are summer people because they are, they are, they have cabin fever for nine months, right? you know? And so when summer comes around, they are ready to cheer on their Red Hawks. They love baseball. They love the guys on the team. They really take good care of them. And it's just a sports town. It's just a, a really cool Midwestern city. And I also love the teams that we played. I loved going to St. Paul. Playing, even in playing in the old stadium, now the new stadium, amazing. 10,000 people a night, ridiculous. But they're not they're now AAA for the Twins. But right. it's just the atmosphere in Fargo. It just makes you feel like I'm so thankful that I'm a baseball player because I feel like I'm at home in Fargo, North Dakota. And on an off day, we can go to the lakes and hang out. And, you know, there's even guys that hunt, you know, a little bit. And so it's, a, it's just a, such a cool place to play. And there's everything there. But, you know, during the winter, you got to plug your car in. It's negative 40. And, you know, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough way to live. So I didn't live there in the wintertime. I just went there for the summer and just enjoyed, you know, 10, 10 p.m. sunsets and playing baseball. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it's good to have passionate fans around and people that are all about it. And like you said, cabin fever, they're ready to go. Um, do you live in, are you back in California in the off season or? Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Yes. Nice. That's great. You've yeah. been to some, I mean, think about the places you've spent a lot of time in Mississippi Valley state and Fargo. And you're just like me, a SoCal guy. Like it just doesn't make sense. <laughs> it's, and, and, you know, and I met my wife who's from Toronto, Canada uh -huh. in Mississippi. So it's like, she came to play soccer. I came to play baseball. And we like to joke about how we found love in a hopeless place. <laughs> and like, really our school is built on a, on a cotton field. And who would have thought that we would just be playing sports there and having a great time. And, just learning culture and, and learning about people that we had, we have no idea about. And next thing you know, we're married with a couple of kids and then I'm in Fargo, North Dakota and having a good time and traveling around the country and, and playing baseball. It's, you know, it's so cool. Yeah, definitely. Um, now I want to talk to you a little bit about how like the minor league lifestyle and underreportedness of it, I guess. Um, 
you had an incident after you guys won the champion two back-to-back championships in Fargo and the uh, underwhel- underwhelming post-game spread. Tell me about that story. <laughs> <laughs> this is a classic story. I know that, you know, we love reminiscing as baseball players. You like talking about the, the, the glory days. And this is one of my favorite stories, which is when I learned a lot. I was still a young kid. You know, it was to, uh, 2010 because we'd won 2009 2010 so we just won back-to-back championships and man i remember being so jacked up like dude we just won back-to-back championships we have the same team like we're just we're gonna win another one and sold out standing room only opening night and we won that opening night we just went back to that championships and i was like oh yeah we got to probably gonna have a good spread we come in the locker room. It was leftover boiled hot dogs that they didn't sell in the stadium. And I was pissed. And so guys started taking hot dogs and I was like, what is this? I started yelling. I took the whole, I, first of all, I took one hot dog, threw it up against the wall. I told the club, I was like, what is going on here? Like we just went back to that championship sellout crowd opening night. What are we doing? Chuck the hot dog against the wall. And next thing you know, I flipped the whole thing, flipped the whole tray. I was like, no, nobody's eating this crap. This is ridiculous. The GM, or the GM comes in. He's like, what's going on, dude? And I was like, we just won back-to-back championships. We sold that opening night. We just won tonight, and you're going to give us this crap? And it was like, you can go out and eat if you want. And I was just, like, infuriated. But from then on, I learned a valuable lesson that I still teach to a lot of my kids is that cancel your expectations. If you have it, you know, you can have goals and you can have these intentions – but when it comes to expecting a steak dinner after something, you're only going to be let down. If you're expecting to ask out a girl and you're expecting her to say yes, you're only going to be let down, you know? And so you're, you're always losing when you have these high expectations. So when you cancel your, you, you kind of like think about something, but you cancel your expectations. Everything's a surprise. Everything is in awe. You're always in awe. It's always, you're always living in gratitude because everything is a surprise and a gift to you. And so I learned a valuable lesson that day, but it's a great story, man. Flipping the hot dogs and just being like, what is this crap? Are you kidding me? Like, but that's minor league baseball. You had to remember you're in Fargo, North Dakota in independent ball, I guess, which you I didn't, mean, you come wouldn't on think. Though, yeah. Like, sellout they, crowd. They, I mean, you got to do better than that. They sold out 45 of their 50 home games the year before. So it's not like they're not making money, but I mean, I guess I just have to not have any expectations. Oh man. That's great. Yeah, no, I love that story. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Just like so that no, tells not, you. nobody's eating it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good for you, man. That, that, that's awesome. No. There was hot dogs all over the ground. I didn't yes. even pick them up, dude. Yeah, I felt bad for the club. I tipped the clubby a little bit because he picked them up. That's, that's awesome. Um, I want to end with some visualization or, you know, mental uh, tips that you would give to people, you know, young athletes or whatever. How do you recommend that they, you know, either whether it's believing in themselves or the way to look at the game or anything like that, that you can recommend for young athletes out there? Definitely. It's the principle of be, do, and have. So I think a lot of humans and especially young humans think that we are going to wait until we have the big league contract to do big league things, to be a big leaguer. And that's upside down. We have to start with our being. What are you going to be? You're in it. So I teach kids like as a 10 year old, you are a big leaguer right now. It already exists. You are a big leaguer. Walk around with big league confidence as you are, as if you are a big leaguer right now, then you start to do the things that big leaguers do. And you start to do the things that help you, push you forward, and then you can have that big league experience. And so with that being comes that, that seeing yourself as this already in the future. And this works for injuries. This works for, you know, if you're injured and your arm is injured and you think that you're never going to play again, all you have to do is visualize and feel what it feels like four months from now when you're healthy again. And not only are you healthy, you're actually stronger than you were before. And when you feel that you start it's a difference. I say, instead of a coach pushing you to go do something, when you see yourself and the feeling of what it is to be healthy or to be a big leaguer or to be a successful businessman, now that feeling is pulling you out of bed. Nobody has to get you out of bed because that feeling, you feel what it feels like and it pulls you out of bed. So there's a difference between somebody pushing you to do work and the feeling just being like, nah, bro, you're, you're going to do it. There's no other choice. 
but it starts with the being. Your being has to be, you have to be a big leaguer first, and then you can do the big league things, and then you can have the big league experience. And right now, you know, we were acting as if we were Olympians. And so now we're doing the things that Olympians do. And then now we're going to have the Olympic experience right now. I'm visualizing every day. I'm visualizing not playing in the Olympics. I'm visualizing myself bending over and getting a medal put over my neck and what that feels like. I visualize myself walking in the closing ceremonies because only true Olympic champions walk in the closing ceremonies. If you're not meddling, they kick you out of Olympic village early and you got to go home. Only the people that medal walk in the closing ceremonies. And so I see myself and I visualize and what it would feel like to be in the closing ceremonies, getting a medal around my neck and what that feels like. And now I'm being pulled to New York to play for the boulders. I'm being pulled away from my family because it's sad and I miss my girls, but I know I have to be here to prepare for that, to win Olympic medal. And so that's what I have to give to everybody listening out there. Be do and have it's not the other way around you don't wait to have something to do something to be something you be it first and then you can have it later i love it man that's incredible that's great that's a great mindset i totally agree with you um i, I mean hey i got nothing else to say after that <laughs> <laughs> no that was awesome i love the message man definitely i'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to you more often man you pump me up Heck yeah, dude. That's what I love to do. Let's just make everybody better around us. And it, it starts with your spirit, your being. And it, when that is, that's quantum physics. You know, your being spreads that it, good vibes, right? You know, only, good vibes only. It's like if your being is so good, it makes everybody else around you that much better. But if you think you have to have something to be that person, it's just like a bitterness and you're an asshole. And sorry, I don't know if you cuss on no, this no, go podcast, ahead. but go. that's what it is. It just, it, it's, it's not good vibes. So yeah. Get that being and man, it's just everyone gets better. So because you have such a good message, where can people reach out to you if they want to get help or talk to you or follow your journey, uh, especially this summer too? Uh, I'm, I'm super accessible on Instagram. You can message me there on uh, Instagram, Facebook. Instagram is penpraise6. Uh, my Facebook is just Zachary Penpraise. And then also I have a website, connectedperformance.life. And so people can go there and check out the website and you can contact me through there. And then also people can email me as well at Zach 33 at gmail.com. Um, my most accessible place is Instagram for sure. And, um, I, you know, I love talking to people and I love just, I love spreading a good message. So I'm very accessible on all those platforms. That's awesome. Well, yeah, I'll definitely put those links in, in the in the show notes at the end. But Zach, you were great, man. I really appreciate it. And uh, I wish you the best of luck this summer. I hope you guys are getting some medals for sure. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me on. I'm glad I finally met you. Yeah, me too. Man, you want to talk about I want to run through a wall now after listening to Zach, man. He's a great motivator. And you can tell he wants people to get better and succeed. And uh, that was awesome. So my thanks to Zach Penpraise. Please hit him up if you have any questions. He's working with a lot of young athletes now. And uh, he's, a, he's a mental skills coach. And if I mean, if you don't want to run through a wall right now, then I don't know what to tell you, man. He was great and uh, great insight from him. And uh, we wish him the best of luck this summer in the Olympics. So uh, hope you guys enjoyed that. As always, you can follow me at Two Tall Sports Podcast. That's on Instagram. On Twitter, it's at Two Tall Sports. You can email the show, Two Tall Sports Podcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube. Please subscribe there so you can see all the videos and listen and watch the interviews on YouTube. We drop them every Thursday. Please do so if you want to watch them. If you want to listen on audio, you can go to Apple Podcasts. You can subscribe there and get all the episodes every Thursday. You can also go to Spotify, Amazon Music, Pandora, Google Play, wherever you get your podcasts, we are there. So just type in Two Tall Sports Podcast. Thank you for listening as always, and we'll see you next week for another great episode. Peace.